My name is Rick Chin and I head up the software team at Desktop Metal and I'm going to give you an overview of our cloud-based software called Fabricate which is used to pre-process your 3D CAD models and then walk that data through the process between the printer, deep binder, and furnace. So I'm running Fabricate right now within my Chrome browser and I'm on the home page what we call the dashboard. Here, um, if I currently had a job running, I would see it front and center in this main part of the screen where I'd see both the job, its progress, and information on the particular device that it's running on. Over on the right-hand side of the screen are all the jobs that are ready to go or to be sent to the next step in the process. So I've, I've pre-processed a 3D model and it's ready for printing. I'll see it listed here like I see these with this green icon. If a job has been printed and it's not ready for debinding, again, I'll see it listed here, but with a blue icon to represent debinding. I could just select on the items here with their checkboxes and then create job to send it off to the next device in the process. But everything begins over here on the left-hand side of the screen. Well, basically select a model that we want to begin the printing process for. Now, in addition to selecting STL files, I can also select up to 20 different file formats. Here, I'm selecting a SOLIDWORKS file. In addition to STL and SOLIDWORKS, we can import file formats like uh, CATIA, Pro Engineer Creo, Inventor, Fusion 360, NX, Solid Edge, Step, Parasolids, and again, it's a list of up to 20 different file formats. Here we can see the model that I have just specified. Uh, I can double click here on the build volume and I can see the size of the model relative to the build volume to make sure that it is what I expect to see. I'll go ahead and say save and continue and that will bring us to the main interaction page within Fabricate which is called the Fab Instruction page. This is where I tell the system this is what I want the end result of the process to be for this particular model. Later on, I'll be able to take this model or, and its fab instruction and combine it with the fab instructions of other models to queue up larger jobs. But for now, the focus is on this particular part. This is where I'll specify things like, what is the material that should be used for this particular part? What should the final scale of this model be? During the course of our process, the models will actually shrink. And we automatically compensate for that behind the scenes for the user. So they never ever have to concern themselves with those things. What you're specifying here is what the final size of the part should be when everything is all said and done. Um, now, in other pre-processing software, you basically go in and you bring up the user interface to manually specify everything and anything about the print process from the um, layer thickness the uh, rate of extrusion, the velocity of the head, and so on, to achieve a certain result. Uh, we give you access to those same parameters, but frankly, the workflow that we've created in Fabricate is a lot cleaner and simpler. And let me explain. So, um, in 3D printing, I can take a model and I can orient it any number of different ways, which includes the standard six orthogonal orientations. So I can just rotate it around, I can print it on its, on its, uh, on its back, its bottom, its top, its side, and each one of these orientations has its pros and cons. Um, in addition to that, to simplify things, we've given the user two pre-configured parameter files, uh, standard and fine. Standard uses a layer thickness of 220 microns. Fine currently gives it a layer thickness of 150 microns. Now, an experienced user of 3D printing would know, given the geometry of the part, what orientation do I want and what particular parameter file should I use to optimize this in a particular way. But to make things simpler for our customers, what we've actually done is we've taken advantage of all the processing power that's available on the cloud. And so we've taken this part and ahead of time, we've calculated what does the tool path look like? How much material will be consumed? How much time will it take to print? What does the debind cycle look like and its time? What about the sintering cycle and the total amount of time that will be required for that? But the thing is, we didn't calculate it once. We actually calculated it 12 times. We took the six orientations times 
these two different parameter files for 12 different ways this part can be produced. And then what we've done is we've actually laid out those 12 different variations on these scales, where over on the left-hand side is good, on the right-hand side is bad. So when I look at, at the scale for time, I can see the shortest time on the left, the longest time on the right. For overall surface quality, I can see the best surface quality on the left, the worst surface quality on the right. And same thing for material usage, right? The least and the max. Uh, one thing to note here in this video is these times are currently off and we're refining these numbers right now as we speak. So it won't take this long to print your models. But the point of this is we have a relative comparison between those 12 different ways that this model can be produced and we can see exactly how they relate to one another. So when I take this part in the, in the current Z orientation using the standard parameter file, this is how it relates to others, other ways of printing this part. And you can see from a surface quality and a material consumption standpoint, not so good. So now if I change the orientation, look at how the sliders change to represent, again, how this orientation um, gets better or worse. And in this case, quality and material consumption get better. We call this our real-time trade-off analysis. So again, if I take this model, let's actually turn it upside down and see what this does. Now, most people would never uh, print a part in this particular orientation. And if we look from a material consumption standpoint, we can see that, yes, this is the worst way to print the part from a material consumption standpoint. And if I want to look at how much support material is generated, I can come down here to this slider and drag it from part display to slider display, support display, and anything in between, depending on what I want to look at. Actually, while I'm here looking at the supports, what you see in dark purple is our special interface layer. This is the ceramic material that's extruded that separates the supports from the part, and it makes it really easy, after the parts are sintered, to remove the part from the support material rather than having to grind it away. Now, it goes one step further, though. Now, what happens in situations where the geometry of the part and the geometry of the uh, supports interlock with one another, which is actually what we have here. You can see in my part, I have these holes on the side. All right? And now when I show the supports, we can see the supports fill those voids and actually create a T shape, right? With these, these basically triangular pins on the side that lock the part in place. Now, um, so now we have a situation where, given that, we would not be able to pull the part off of the supports even with the interface layer in place. But look at this. When I actually zoom in where that pin meets the part, you'll actually see there's a very fine seam there. And that seam is something that we have actually placed in the supports so that you can actually pull that pin out so that you can actually eventually lift the part off of the rest of the supports. So we actually look at the geometry of the part, the geometry of the supports, and then we strategically place vertical and horizontal seams. Uh, the seams vertically are, are these gaps like I just showed you a moment ago. Horizontal seams, we just put more interface layer in. And this allows the supports to again break apart so without any tools you can actually separate the part from the support. Now the reason I showed the supports was again this the uh, real-time trade-off analysis is showing us that we're actually consuming a lot of material and we can see that when we look at the supports and the part material. Well not only does this interface tell us the good again on the left and the bad over on the right but it's also an opportunity for me to tell the system how do I want to optimize this part. In this particular case, maybe I want to print it and I just want to do it in such a way that I minimize the amount of material that's used. So I'll bring it to the happy end of the scale and let go. And now I can see the part is oriented on end, which allows the system to construct a smaller raft and it uses significantly less support material. But I can also see how other um, axes get better or worse, such as the fabrication time has actually grown as a result of that change. Or I might want to say, what's the best way to optimize this part for overall surface quality? 
And if you look, it's laid the part down so all these circular features can be printed or rendered as circles versus stacked rectangles. So it allows us, you know, in these particular geometries to avoid that stair-stepping effect. We call that terracing. So we've come up with a way to measure it, quantify it, and then compare different ways of printing models. And so again, the idea is you don't have to pick the particular orientation. You don't have to specify the particular parameters. You just tell the system how you want to optimize the model, and then it shows you the best way to do it. Um, in addition to that, not only can you orient the part based on these standard orientations, but you can also do a custom orientation as well. If I select the model, I'll highlight it, and that puts me in the custom orientation interface. Now I have the ability to manually rotate the model or orient it based on face. So now I can move my mouse around on the screen and you can see the arrow display that in this case, let's point that up. So wherever I select, it's going to reorient the model so the arrow points up okay, to give me that particular result. And these options are not exclusive or mutually exclusive. You have the ability to orient by face and then I can rotate as well. So let's rotate it, say, 45 degrees in the XY plane. Okay. So you got a great way to get exactly what you want when you print the model. Okay. And if you'd like, you have the opportunity to look at the toolpath here on the Fab Instruction page. So I'll select on that option. You'll see the legend over here on the right-hand side. So each portion of the toolpath has its own color, and you can turn those items on and off. So I can grab this, and I can look at up to any particular layer that I'd like in the process. And again, I can come here and turn things on and off as I look at the display of the part. Now, like I mentioned before, the FAB instruction page, its purpose is to allow the user to specify what I want the end result of this particular part to be. Now that I've specified what the material is, what the size is, and how I want it optimized, then I can go ahead and say continue. And what the system will now do is it'll generate the instructions for the three steps in the process. It'll generate the toolpath and the instructions for printing. Um, the debind instructions and the centering instructions for the part. And then it takes me to the first step in the process, which is setting up the job for the part on the printer. So I can see it placed on the platform. One thing to note is the part has actually been located on the back side of the platform. And that's because the platform is cantilevered or supported from the back. So we automatically nest the parts that you specify in such a way that the, the center of gravity of the nest is as close to the back as possible. But now I have the ability to not only print this part, but I can select other parts by selecting them here on the right hand rail to add them to the nest. I can change the quantity of the part. One thing you should notice here is it'll also tell me the maximum number of this part that I can have in the nest if I keep all the other components the same. So right now I can fit up to three additional um, hinges in this particular nest or up to five additional, and that's or, five additional uh, yokes to this nest as well. And it's just a handy way to see what the capacity is that you have available on the system. Um, so here is where you will actually select the particular printer that you want to send the device to. Uh, when this is fully functional, we'll actually be able to see the material that's loaded and the quantity as well, and what the status of the printer is, whether it's active or idle. And when I'm satisfied, I can go ahead and say send to printer to, um, to actually send this particular job to the queue for that device. Um, Another thing I'd like to show you just very quickly about the interaction that we've designed for our customers. If I go ahead and let's grab another part. Let's do the valve. So this happens to be an STL file that we're reading in. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and open that up in the fab instruction page. And like I mentioned before, we're calculating those 12 combinations of 
orientation and parameter files for you. And it's actually showing you here that they're in the process of being calculated in parallel. But if you know exactly what orientation, like I want to print this part with the Y orientation with the fine parameters, you can go ahead and select those without waiting for the calculation to be done. And then once that particular one is complete, the continue button will become available and then you can just move forward. So you don't have to wait. Um, another thing I want to point out is view manipulation or navigation using the mouse key in the software. Okay? Um, when I double click on any open space with, within the screen, I do a zoom to fit of, the, of everything in the current view. If I do a double click on a particular item, here I'm going to double click on the platform, it'll zoom in on that. Or I can double click on the model and it'll zoom in on that. When I rotate and zoom in, wherever you put the mouse on the model, um, it's actually going to be the center of focus. So let's say I want to rotate around this particular hole here on the top of the model. I place the model there and begin the rotation. When I do, that location is moved to the center of the screen and rotation then pivots around that location. If I want to look at this particular hole over here, same sort of thing, move the mouse over here and start the rotation and it centers that on that portion of the screen. Same thing with zoom. If I want to zoom in on this hole over here, move the mouse to that location and then start zooming in. Okay. So it's a nice convenient way to kind of view the model without a lot of effort and a lot of thinking because after a while uh, users will get accustomed to this notion of just move the mouse to the area that I want to focus on and then begin the rotation or the zoom. All right, that is an overview of the Fabricate software and how it works in terms of pre-processing models and creating instructions that are sent to your printer, debinder, and furnace. Thanks a bunch for the time.